excited and always so glad to have you with us today. Um, before we begin our review of Lesson 27 and before we open in prayer, I want to apologize to all of our listening audience and especially to uh, Professor Dr. Richard J. Boakim. I have been pronouncing his name incorrectly. We are actually studying from his uh, commentary on the Word Biblical Commentary, Jude Second Peter, Richard Boakim. And I have been saying, Bacham. I am so thankful for my professors at the Messianic Studies Institute for correcting us there and bringing this to our attention. So thank you, uh, professors at the Messianic Studies Institute. I'm a part of an awesome reading group on Sundays um, with the Messianic Studies Institute. We're reading through, let me grab this for you here. We're actually reading together through Jerusalem crucified, Jerusalem risen, the resurrected Messiah, the Jewish people, and the land of promise by Mark S. Kinzer. And it was during our discussion of this book um, that our professors actually pronounced his name correctly. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've been pr pronouncing uh, Professor Dr. Richard Day. Jay Borkham's name incorrectly. So I wanted to apologize there and get that corrected before we start. So again, with that said, welcome to Life in the Vine Ministries, Columbus, Ohio. Again, my name is Jana Stewart and let us open with a word of prayer as we begin our review of Lesson 27. This will be Lesson 28 today. Avina Malkina, our Father and King, we praise and thank you for this awesome time that we've been having together on um, studying around and worshiping around your word. We invite you, Royal Kakadash, to be with us. Truly, you are the one who leads and guides us into all truth. And so we just open our hearts and minds and the minds of our understanding to your instruction as you lead and guide us today in the word of God. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen and amen. So again, welcome. Uh, many thanks to all of you who do uh, spend time with us during this study. We're always excited when we can all grow together and study together in God's word. So, um, just wanted to uh, give you a quick review. Uh, lesson 27, because this is 28, ended with our discussion of uh, Richard J. Borkham's commentary notes on 2 Peter 1, 3. In today's lesson, we will continue with our study focus on his commentary notes on verse 3 of 2 Peter. We always like to invite you to go to our YouTube page. You see that there on the screen. Uh, we invite you to go there so that you can review the lesson prior to the one we're do that we're doing now so that you can have more of a clear understanding of where we are today and where we've been if this is your first time joining us. And that way you can um, engage the lesson in its entirety. So with that said, we are going to begin our lesson for today and get started. discussion looking at some historical background on the Roman cult of emperor worship from the worship of Roman emperors. It is written, the author of that journal is Henry Fairfield Burton. In that journal, we did learn some very interesting things. So far, we've learned that uh, Roman emperors were deified and worshiped as gods and that even the human spirit itself 
uh, was seen as being divine. We also learned that the father of the family was worshipped as a god. Today we will continue our study along these lines from the journal The Worship of Roman Emperors, author Henry Fairfield Burden. We will begin our new lesson reading from page 85. Our last time together we read from page 81 of that journal. We also made some reference to the YouTube link, or I should say the YouTube uh, documentary, Becoming a God, Deification of the Roman Emperor. If you Google Becoming a God, Deification of the Roman Emperor, you can actually go into that YouTube link. And this is a great beginning study of um, understanding the deification of Roman emperors, as well as um, you can further your study on this subject by um, looking for various scholarly, if you're a scholarly person, scholarly study on this subject or just various journals on the subject um, of the deification of the Roman emperors. If you were not with us before, remember what we are doing, the reason we took this journey is because we are focusing our attention on page 177 of um, Richard J. Boakim's commentary notes on 1 Peter, I'm sorry, 2 Peter, chapter 1 verse 3 and we were spending our time looking at his statement here as it relates to the phrase thea dunamis divine power remember we've learned so far that it is or was a standard term in greek literature he's given us various references to study which give us some great a literary background as to the usage of that Greek term Thea Dunamis. But we focus our attention on the statement he made after that on this page where he states, and I am quoting again, he says this referring back to the reference um, of, of later Christian writers, Justin in particular, whom he mentioned his usage of Thea Dunamis, he says this, referencing to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1 uh, and verse 3, is the only occurrence in his, his words, Christian literature. We did a great study on understanding these as the um, pillars, the, the epistle pillars of the, the book, but 2 Peter one chapter one verse three using this vocabulary and he said that there is nothing unusual about the use of the term i'll just read it here um, directly he says let me find that spot oh here we go he said there is nothing unusual about the idea Express in the verse the idea of theodunamis, divine power, but he said it is still significant that Second Peter expresses it in this Hellenistic religious phraseology. So what we are doing, and the reason that we went and referenced some of these, um, this journal, and we went to this website uh, here, the YouTube YouTube site. I'm sorry to get just a beginner's background as to the usage of this Greek term is because of what he said here, it is significant that um, the writer of Second Peter uses the term. So we're just kind of like scratching a little bit to see why is it significant? And that's why we're doing this. So I hope that helps you if you're, this is your first time with this as to why are we looking at this when we are actually studying uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Hopefully that helps you. 
So what we're going to do today is we're going to continue a little further looking at the journal that I mentioned to you earlier. And we're going to look at page 85 just to look a little bit further at um, the deification of Roman emperors. And then we'll look at a couple of pictures with some some descriptives of a couple of Roman emperors and temples that were dedicated to them. So hopefully that has helped you so far and we will continue in our lesson for today. As I said before, in our last lesson, we will be reading today an excerpt from the journal article you see on the screen, The Worship of Roman Emperors Henry Fairfield Burton, The Biblical World. And I wanted to put it here so that if you yourself wanted to maybe go um, to research this article, you could. And that way you can read it, it, it in its entirety because we're just going to be reading from um, page 85, just an excerpt from page 85. And we only read an excerpt from page 81 in our previous lesson. So I just wanted to have this here on the screen for you so that you may also yourself uh, go and look at this journal in its entirety. Okay, so we're going to be reading from page 85 here now. We will now continue our study and as we said earlier, we're reading from page 85 of the Worship of the Roman Emperors by the author Henry Fairfield Burton from the journal. And what we're reading here is on the screen is just a little bit more information to help us understand the uh, worship of the emperor, Roman emperors as gods. And it reads here on the screen, the public imperial worship took several distinct forms which may be designated as the Roman cult, the worship of the Divi. And remember, we learned that Divi just means the worship of the emperor as a god at the capital. The provincial cult conducted by the provinces as such, the municipal cult conducted by the individual cities, and then the popular cult, the organized worship, on the part of the lower classes. The worship of the deified emperors naturally flourished at Rome where they are best known and likely to be longest remembered, that, of course, in Rome. Separate temples were dedicated to many of them in the city as the existing remains of temples of Caesar, Augustus, and Vespian and Antonius still testify. And what we will do now is we'll take a look at some pictures of temples and some bust of the uh, Roman emperors who were deified as gods. So we're looking now at a picture of the Domitian Temple. The Domitian Temple is the first imperial temple which was dedicated to Emperor Domitian who called himself the Lord of Lords and God of the Gods. As he was the top person of Roman Empire, nobody told him he was just a mortal. Domitian's temple was built on a terrace measuring 50 by 100 meters on the south side of Domitian Square. You can visit the website you see there on the screen, biblicalephesus.com, and can learn some additional information about the Domitian Temple, the ruins of Domitian Temple. Also, there's a website about ephesus.com 
Domitian Temple that you can also visit. So that's a picture that you see there on the screen of the Domitian Temple ruins, uh, biblical Ephesus. Now on the screen, we see a statue of what is believed to be Domitian. And this um, picture that we have on the screen here is from the site that the world may know, Temple of Domitian. Um, and you can visit the site you see the uh, link there. You can visit the site and learn lots of things, interesting things about uh, the emperors and lots of information about biblical uh, sites. It's a very good site to visit. So um, you see it here on the screen. I invite you to visit this website so you can learn even more about uh, Domitian and the other emperors and emperor worship as well. And what we're looking at here is a statue of what is believed to be Domitian. It stood near the temple and altar, uh, the temple of Domitian and the altar. And based on the huge arm and head that have been excavated, researchers believe that the statue was 27 feet tall, 27 feet tall. I do invite you to visit that site because there's uh, lots of more detailed information uh, about this temple and it is quite interesting. Our next picture that we're looking at is the Colossus of Nero. Colossus Neros Nerosis was a 30 meter, 98 foot bronze statue that the Emperor Nero, 37 to 68 AD, created in the vestibule of his Domus Aurea, the Imperial Villa complex, which spanned a large area from the north side of the Palatine Hill across the Villian Ridge to the Esquiline Hill. It was modified by Nero's successors into a statue of the sun god Sol. The statue was eventually moved to a spot outside the Flavian Amphitheater, which, according to one of the more popular theories, became known by its proximity to the Colossus as the Colosseum. You can visit uh, various sites to learn more about the Colossus of Nero, and you will find some quite interesting information, not only about uh, the Colossus of Nero, but about Nero himself. We will look at a bust of Nero here, uh, who Nero was the emperor of Rome. Um, and we will look here next at a bust of him and just look at some information about him as well. We are now looking at a bust of Emperor Nero of Rome. Here on the screen it reads, perhaps the most infamous of Rome's emperors, Nero Claudius Caesar, 37 to 68 AD, ruled Rome from 54 AD until his death by suicide 14 years later. He is best known for his debaucheries, political murders, persecution of Messiah followers, my words, and a passion for music that led to the probably apocryphal rumor that Nero quote, fiddled while Rome burned during the Great Fire of 64 AD. There on the screen, you also have a link that you can visit, and there are various other ones to learn more about the Emperor Nero of Rome. And like it says, he was the worst and the most infamous of Rome's emperors. Another interesting note um, that we did find by uh, visiting various other sites is a note, especially on the word, quote, fiddled in the information that you see there on the screen. Uh, one note brought to our attention, we must remember that during his time that fiddles or 
stringed instrument, instruments, bowed stringed instruments, wouldn't appear in Europe for another 800 years. So more than likely, he was playing a lyre. And I thought that was a good note. And then another um, interesting note that we found is the, um, most of you may have even read this, especially as it relates to the Messiah followers and his cruelty uh, to them in particular. Be when he was accused of the great fire of 64 AD, in order to stave off the public lynching, Nero immediately accused the new sect of Messiah followers who were called, quote, Christians, for burning the city. He rounded up Messiah followers, wrapped them in pitch, dipped them in tar, and burned them as torches for his dinner parties. He sewed them in animal skins and threw them to the dogs at the circus near the Vatican Hill. His cruelty was so extreme that the people began to have sympathy for the Messiah followers. Another interesting note, um, in 64 AD, there was a great fire, like we said, in Rome. And here is the quote. Uh, it says, Rome had burned. In order to mask his crime, Emperor Nero blamed the new religious sect called Christians, we know as Messiah followers, and began his first imperial persecution of them. The imperial persecutions lasted until the edict of Milan in 313 AD. This is a quote from Sandra Sweeney Silver from the early uh, christianhistory.org site. And so you can visit that site as well if you want to learn more about the Nero fire, Nero the arsonist, you could type that in, or the Emperor Nero and find some additional information about that. Um, another thing I will say with to you is the Edict of Milan was a proclamation that permanently established religious quote quote toleration for these are my words Messiah followers within the Roman Empire. It was the outcome of a political agreement concluded in modern Milan that we would know it today between the Roman emperors and uh, Constantine the first and Licinius in February 313. Very interesting information and here again all of this is helping us as we were and are looking at the significance of the term Thea Dunamis, divine power, which was a standard term in Greek literature, and what it meant in the Hellenistic culture at that time, and why it is significant that Second Peter expresses this term and uses Hellenistic religious phraseology. And so what we're looking at is getting a very, very, very brief uh, understanding of the term and what it meant in the culture at that time as Second Peter chapter 1 verse 3 uses it in that verse just to kind of bring us back to where we, where we began. So hopefully so far this information has helped in giving you just a picture of and again like I said earlier if you want to do additional study um, about emperors, Roman emperors being worshipped and deified, there is a lot of information that you can obtain to help you in your studies there. Okay. This brings us to the end of Lesson 28 and Richard Borkim's discussion of the phrase Thea Dunamis, Divine Power, in verse 3 of 2 Petrarch. We completed our discussion of the worship of the Roman emperors. And remember, we were looking at the journal written by Henry Fairfield Burton. We've completed that discussion. 
We looked at pages 81 and 85 of that journal. We briefly explored for information to help us to begin obtaining an understanding of what the standard term in Greek, theodunamis, divine power meant in the Greek literature. And I think so far we've gathered, you know, enough to spark our interest to study further if you so desire. And I think we have enough to begin that, that process. And so remember, you can actually go to those websites that I mentioned in, on uh, during the time of our discussion so that you yourself can read them and read additional information that I did not share with you if you want to continue your studies. I think that was really good. Hopefully you learned as much as I did. Um, also, I, I think I mentioned in the last one, a real good one to go to, good website, I should say, is www.jstor.org, which is a really good website for journals and studies. And the one that I mentioned to you is on that website. If you would like to know more about Yeshua, and his kingdom and his kingship, we invite you to email us at the email address you see there on the screen. Uh, we would love to hear from you, or you can give us a call at 1-614-532-0203. If you have any questions, any prayer requests, um, if you just want to you know, ask, learn more about who we are, we would love to hear from you. And what we would like to do also is invite you to visit our YouTube page, Life in the Vine with Janice Stewart. And there you will find um, our devotionals. We have a Life in the Vine devotional as well as our Life in the Vine uh, biblical studies that we do together. Before we close, I would like to um, pray with us and then in, and we will be with each other again our next time together. Abida Malkina, our Father and King, we thank you for leading and guiding us by the Ruach HaKodesh in our studies this evening. We thank you that you will engraft what we've learned upon our hearts, Lord, and that we will be continually transformed into the image of your dear son, Yeshua HaMashiach. We do pray now, Lord, for those who desire to know more about Yeshua and his, your kingdom, Lord, that you will begin to draw them unto yourself. You said in your word that no man can come to the Father, come to you, or learn more about your kingdom. These are my paraphrases here, without coming to Yeshua first. And so we, we just pray for those who would like to begin that journey that you will begin to open the eyes of their understanding, Lord, and that they will continue to hear and hear the word, uh, that they may be also uh, drawn closer to you and want to know more about you and your kingdom. We also lift up those who do know you and those who are following after your righteous, following after you for your righteousness and for your kingdom's sake, that you will keep them, Lord, that your shalom peace will be with them and that you will lead and guide them continually into all truth. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen, amen and amen. Thank you so much for being with us. Once again, my name is Janice Stewart. This is Life in the Vine Ministries in Columbus, Ohio. And we look forward to seeing you again next time. Shalom.